out there, my name is Milesy, and welcome to my channel. So let's just today take a look up here at importing and exporting a pattern, and we'll just kind of go through everything really quickly within that process, and then in further videos I will talk about specifics. Now I am using PC Stitch uh, version 11.00.015. Um, basically, I'm using PC Stitch 11. I think it's the most up-to-date version, but you know what? I don't know. So, there are a few different ways that you can import and export your patterns. You can just straight up open one. If you have any patterns here, and I have so many patterns, so let's go and just pick one. A Gretsuko. So, I already have the pattern. You just click on it, you open it, and eventually, there we go, it will show up. But let's say we want to actually import one. So we go to File, Import. Okay, so when we get this Select Image to Import, uh, you can either grab a picture directly from your digital camera or a scanner. Uh, you can resume the last imported image, which was this frog that I was working on last night. I don't have a picture on the clipboard. Um, let me go grab one real quick. Grab something from DeviantArt. Copy image. And that has opened up this one for us, and it can see what was on our clipboard right there. Uh, most of the time, you're going to be grabbing a picture from your computer. So we'll go into Browse, and we've got a Gretzko here. We'll just use her again. And the import image is 200 by 200 pixels. So the first thing we need to do is go into Size and change that. And when we hit Preview, it will be a direct one-to-one -one conversion over here. There we go. It takes a little bit of time. We can zoom out a bit. Uh, I think we need to put this on to fit. Yeah, there we go. And you can see that it is a direct one-to-one -one conversion as much as it can be when you're dealing with a limited color palette. Now, if we were to keep this at 100, which was the, the uh, default, you can see that everything has become choppy and weird and gross. We don't want that. We want that to be a direct conversion. So make sure that when you put your image together, uh, however you do it, I've done a few tutorials on that. Make sure that your image starts off, or ends up rather, the size that you want your Stitch product to be, because PC Stitch is not very good at uh, downscaling. So we can go in here and we can crop. So let's say we just want like this area. So we do that, we hit crop, and that will show up over here as well, and it's changed our import image size. And we'll eventually change over here. This process always takes a long time, but I don't like that. So we have undo. And there we go. And I'll make sure that I cut out all of these really long gaps. It can be a few minutes to wait uh, there sometimes, depending on how big your pattern that you're trying to make is and how involved it is. So background, we have three different ways. We can select something freehand. We can select a rectangle. And I don't think, yeah, you can actually hold down shift and get it to be a perfect square. I don't use this very often uh, because, like I said, it's easier if you just crop out what you have as you are creating your uh, pattern. Or you can do an oval. And I bet if we hold down shift, it becomes a perfect circle. Yep. And we can either clear inside the selection or clear outside it. So if we clear outside we get this perfect circle right there around her face, and it will show up over here as well, eventually. There we go, but I don't want that, so we'll undo that as well. And normally, if I want to do something round like that, I just use paint.net to make it round. I don't usually use PC Stitch's import tools too much. Now, the foreground is not quite the same. The foreground is going to highlight colors instead of crop something out, so... Let's go ahead and do the same thing. We'll create a circle. And what it's going to do is everything in this circle is going to be the emphasis of the pattern. And it says the percentage of the palette 
devoted to foreground colors. So everything within this circle, 75% of the color palette will be in here, and then everything outside it, uh, you can see here, got really muted and not quite as bright. Like the color of her shirt over here changed, and the background changed. And you'll be able to see that again when I reset the image. Watch over here, and you'll see these colors will shift quite a lot. Okay, now you can see that her shirt is a little bit more blue again, and the gradient here in the background is more even. Again, this is not something that I would normally use within PC Stitch because you can do that a little bit easier and with a little bit more control um, in a decent photo editor. It just takes a different sort of uh, process to do that. So generally when I import something to PC Stitch, it is already ready to go and it looks exactly how I want it to look. Now size, this is where we change the width and you can do it by stitches or by inches. It's generally easy to do it by stitches. Uh, the horizontal cloth count, you don't really need that. That's just telling the uh, pattern later on what the uh, default is going to be. Generally, these things, none of this you really need to uh, change. You want to keep all three of these selected, and you don't need to change the uh, cloth count really at all. Now, adjustments. Every now and then, I will need to use the adjustments. These are just where you can change brightness levels. So you can maybe bring out these reds a little bit more, uh, enhance that glow around her. And we'll see what it looks like. It kind of gives you a little preview over here, which got really small. And now she seems kind of washed out, but that might actually be a good thing. Uh, the reason for that is that when you are stitching something, it's always going to be darker than what you see on screen. So you might want to brighten that up a little bit and the colors might look a little bit better. And when we did that, it actually did make the gradient over here in the background a lot more smooth. It took out that brown kind of black area back here. Uh, her eyes seem like they got a lot brighter. And you can change the contrast, the saturation, and uh, the RGB hue all by doing the same thing. And I kind of like this, so I'm going to keep it that way. Uh, now, there is one thing that is very important to note. PC Stitch 10 did not do this. 11 does. And I still have not found a way to override this. So we can see that her ears and her eyes, and there's a lot of white on this pattern. PC Stitch 11 will not chart white, uh, white pixels. I don't know why. Uh, so this is something that we will have to go in manually later to fix. And I don't know if there is an option somewhere. I need to look for it a little bit deeper, but I haven't found it. And it drives me insane because I feel like PC Stitch, the people behind it, have really lost focus about what people use their software to do. And it's very annoying, so I will show you that in a little bit. So if I've ever put out patterns that have missing stitches, this is why. And the floss, this is where we can pick uh, the floss palette that we use. DC, uh, DMC Stranded Cotton is the default. I have two different versions of it. I have uh, the current set that has all of the colors, and I have the old set that only has um, the older colors. It doesn't have either of the two new sets of floss. And it comes with a lot of stuff built in. I added uh, one of the DMC sets. I can't remember which one I added. And I have my own floss added in here, and I'll do a video on how to do that as well. I've kind of done one in the past. But it has beads, it has Weeks Dye Works, it's got a bunch of stuff. We'll use Stranded Cotton. Uh, you can also map colors to floss palette. But I don't have any floss palettes uh, really saved, so we're just going to use an available list. And because I made a change, it's going to reflect that over here, but that's fine. Uh, you can also set your maximum colors, and I like to set my colors at 200 for a full, uh, for a full coverage piece like this. And this doesn't necessarily mean that it will use 200 colors, that's just the absolute maximum 
it will allow itself to use and this is what it would look like with 200 colors now we could bump that up and say 500 i'm not sure exactly what uh, the amount that dmc has but it's around 500 so that would be every single stranded cotton color that they, that they have and we'll be able to see over here that it will it may change by quite a bit Okay, and you can see that there was a little bit of color shift that happened. Um, mostly the gradients got a little bit better. I think something changed up here in her ear as well, but um, I don't like stitching 500 colors. 200 is about the absolute maximum I can handle, so we're going to go ahead and change that back. Okay, and at this point, that is everything that we might need to do to import it, so we're going to go ahead and click OK and here we go so we have this i'm going to zoom out a little bit so that we can see the whole thing and i like to turn off the grid now here's another thing that pc stitch 11 does that 10 did not that i as far as i know this is just hard coded in and you cannot override it but uh you'll be able to see it here if i turn on just symbols it maps the symbols so that you can see it without color you can still see the design which is kind of neat in its own way and you can see here what i mean where there's all these big blank areas because it did not map white but that does mean that your symbol chart is going to be in a different order every single time so if you're the kind of person who does a lot of stitching and you memorize that chart and you know vaguely okay this symbol is in the last third of the uh of the color key every time this is going to screw you up especially because it does have numbers and letters in here and you know we've got three over here and then there's nine and then here's a five and an eight and everything's out of order and it's super irritating and annoying so this is actually when I would just individually, uh, if you click on a symbol down here, so let's do this, and then we click up here and it will change the symbol. And this is when I would individually do this. And I normally go through and change symbols anyway because there are three that I don't like to use. I don't like to use this one right here uh, because that looks too much like the L symbol right there. They look very similar. I don't like that. Uh, there are two of these and as we can see uh, they are both dark blue already which means that they are both in here so let's see if we can find them um, I can't see either of them but here's one and there's another one so it has duplicate symbols and it has two duplicate symbols so it has that hourglass looking one and then it has two asterisks right here. And these ones, they aren't exactly duplicates, but they're like this little line and the L. Unless you know that they're different, you won't see that they're different. Um, I ran into this a few times when I was just starting out making patterns. So I would actually go through, uh, and I do this on every single full coverage pattern. I don't necessarily do it for my sprites though, because it's not really worth it when you've only got six or seven colors but i go through and i manually change every single symbol to uh actually be in a reasonable order and this also makes sure that there are no duplicates anywhere and that can take a half hour or more so i'm not going to do the whole thing now let's zoom in here and we can see that for whatever ridiculous reason uh, it does not chart white so basically now what we have to do is we have to go back to the symbols right here and we'll go into available colors and we'll scroll all the way down and we'll have this be 5200 since I don't see that it is stitched anywhere nope it's not anywhere and we'll just use this paint bucket here to fill in as many of the areas as we can and we'll zoom out a little bit because 
Okay, we charted this for 200 colors, and maybe as we were going, that sounded very doable, but now that we see all of these colors, uh, we can go to palette tools, and this is the only way to see how many colors are actually on your chart, because PC Stitch apparently thinks that it doesn't matter. So we can see that it is using, it was using 199 until I added the white, so now it is using 200 colors, but mm, maybe that seems like a little much, so we'll drop it down to 150 and preview it. And like the import uh, tools, this can take a long time to do, so we'll just sit here and wait for it. And we'll take a look here, does that still look good? That is the burning question. Uh... We can see here that, yeah, everything seems pretty decent. We don't lose a whole lot of detail. We don't lose a whole lot of color. Um, her shirt seems a little bit different. And I think that's about it. We lose a little bit of the finer gradient in the background is what it looks like. But other than that, 150 looks pretty good. Let's see what happens if we drop it to 100. Okay, and when we dropped it down to 100, we lost a lot of quality. We can see that the background got really choppy. It's not smooth at all. We lost a lot of the detail around her eyes. So I'm going to say we can drop it down to 150. And 150 should be a good, safe level for us to be at. Like you can see, we lost a lot of the... Uh, gradient in her ear as well so let's pay attention to that yep when we brought it back up to 150 we mostly got that gradient back uh it's just the uh, little corners here on the background which have mostly changed uh and it looks like a little bit of her shirt but that's not too bad mostly we want to uh, preserve the detail in her face and her face looks pretty good so let's go ahead and keep that there we go and we can see now that the chart size has become much smaller. So now if we go into palette tools, reduce entries again, we can see that it is on 150. And I know that's hard to see. I have my uh, fonts a little bit bigger than PC Stitch can handle. And so now when I go through and perform my laborious task of fixing all of these symbols, it will take me a little less time, and we can see there's still a little bit of choppiness in the background now, but otherwise that looks like it will be pretty good. So now what you want to go ahead and do is go into the pattern properties, and here you can put in the title, Retsuko. So you've got your title, your author, your copyright information. You can change uh, the height in stitches or inches. Uh, I usually don't change this. Uh, you want it on a square weave because most fabric is. Um, I keep it at 14 count just because that does seem to be about the uh, standard. So usually all I change is the title, author, and copyright. And the display, again, I don't tend to change anything in here. Uh, none of this really seems to uh, matter too much. Uh, for the user when they're using the pattern or for you. Uh, what this does is it will change something elsewhere. So the numbers that you put in here, uh, back sit, stitch, uh, stitches width 20% of the grid square, that's just going to change what it kind of looks like on the pattern itself. So French knot, uh, the bead width, it's not really anything that you need to change. This is actually a really good value, so... We're not going to do anything there. Back there, the uh, stitch options. This will change the floss usage chart. So we're telling PC Stitch to calculate floss usage based on full stitches being two strands, three quarter stitches being two strands. This is basically uh, what PC Stitch uses to make calculations elsewhere. And properties. This is where I like to put where the colors uh, are. I mean, it doesn't really matter what fabric you use. If it needs a certain kind of fabric, you'd put that in there. Keywords are kind of pointless because you don't really need them unless you're building up your own library within PC Stitch. Company also, unless you're selling patterns, 
professionally. I don't even really use that because that's pretty much taken care of in the copyright. So I just use the fabric section to put down how many colors there are. You can have your own logo, which is really cool. So that is what will show up on the color key, is your logo right there. Uh, you can get rid of it by clicking that X. You can click on this mountain button uh, to open up a folder. And I think my logos live in artwork. So yeah, there we go. That's just where all of my logos are, but we don't need that. You can make pattern read only. Uh, so if you want to, instead of releasing a PDF file, you can release the pattern fire file as well. And you can make it read only so that they can't make changes to the pattern. Um, they can't save it as something else. They get that pattern and that is what they get. You can also give the pattern a password. So say you want to release the pattern file to your patrons rather than a PDF. The patrons would need that password and if the pattern gets leaked, anyone who's not supposed to have the pattern would also need the password to be, to be able to use it. But I don't like to do that, so we'll just click OK. And there we go. So uh, the floss usage, I'll show you this, uh, because this is another really decent part of the pattern. So we'll go up here and this will tell you how many stitches and how many skeins you need. And I can't make that any bigger, so that's a little bit difficult to see. So if we sort this by skeins, we'll see that we need three, four skeins, really, of Snow White. Uh, whatever color DMC-22 is, we need a skein of that, a skein of uh, yellow. But yeah, it looks like the Winter White's the one that we're on, is the only one. If we're stitching full crosses on 14 count that we'd need four skeins for. Uh, and that's what I was saying earlier in the properties. It, uh, this is what changes depending on how many strands you use. So if we go back in here and go to stitch options, and let's say that full stitches, we want these to be four strands. So we click OK. Palette tools, floss usage. Now we can see that Snow White became 6.4 skeins. Uh, so that is what will get changed when you mess with those. So let's go ahead, change it back over here, back to two. And to get to floss usage, you just click anywhere in this white area down here and you right click, and then you'll get this menu right here. So uh, another thing that we can do is clear unused entries which in this case did nothing. Uh, that is there sometimes, not always, sometimes when you import a pattern, it will import a few other colors that aren't being used. And usually when you reduce the entries down, uh, when we went from 200 to 150, it will clear those out first because it uh, usually will clear them out by priority. Not always. Uh, but also if you'd start off with just a blank palette. It gives you some default colors, but say I want this one and I'm going to do this and uh, that's a nice shade of green. I want that one. And here we go. That is just not very nice. Uh, then I want mm, this kind of blue. I want that blue and then I want that pink. And isn't my pattern lovely? So if we go down here, palette tools and clear unused entries, it will only show us the colors that are being used in this lovely pattern I've created. Let's go ahead and get, that's loud. You guys can't even hear that because I muted desktop audio. That makes a very loud noise and I'm wearing headphones. So at this point, we've got our pattern created. Uh, we've got it imported. We've done all of the important stuff. Now we need to save it. So we'll go ahead and save as a Gretzico 2 because I think I kind of like this one a little bit better than the one that I created earlier. We'll see. I'll save them all and then when I actually get to this pattern, uh, I'll pick the best one that I like. So we've saved it. And if you put in the title here before you save it, when you go to save the... Uh, pattern as you see we hit save as 
it will automatically put that in there. It automatically tried to save it as a Gretsuko. I had to put the two in there. So that is nice. Now we'll want to print it. And printing is something that can be a little bit difficult with these because this page is kind of overwhelming and confusing. So let's go ahead and talk about this screen. Uh, I like to stitch at six stitches per inch and I will show you what all of these mean. Uh, but you could also fit it to a single page, which in this case would be ridiculous. Uh, you can tell it to go on to a certain amount of pages or you can just say to go automatically. And when you click automatic, PC Stitch will determine the best possible way to print it uh, for that pattern. And you can set a minimum stitch per inch count. So you can say, you know, I go, you know, find the best thing, but I don't want to go any smaller than eight stitches per inch because I'm blind and I can't see that. So I'll show you the difference between what I like over here. So sti six stitches, stitches per inch. Actually, I'll show you all. So first we will fit it to a single page. And if we hit preview, it's trying real hard. We get a pattern that you have no chance in hell of ever reading. We are zoomed in at 500%. And we have 200 stitches by 200 stitches. You will need a microscope to read this. So let's go back to auto. And we can see that it has the title, it has the author, there's the copyright right there, and the page number. And then if we go up here to page two, title, author, copyright, my website, uh, it shows you how many colors, shows you, the, shows you the dimension, and it shows you the design area if you are stitching this on 14 count ADA. And then we have our color key right here, which usually will go in numerical order. You can change that if you are, uh, if you like something else, if you want it to go by shade order, for instance, or by the name of the floss, if you're weird. Uh, but most people will just keep it in numerical order. And and one thing, uh, one of the reasons I do like to stop at 200 colors is because at the settings that I have my computer on, because you can go into PC Stitch and change the font so that if you're blind like me, you can read it a little bit better. I'll show you guys how to do that in another video. 200 colors will fit on one single page which is another reason why I like to stop at 200. So we don't really want that on a single stitch or on a single page. So let's see what six stitches per inch looks like. So that looked like it was 21 pages. And I can see some areas where I didn't quite get all of the, uh, all of the stitches on there. That's something that does just take a stupid amount of time. And we can see now, just scrolling through, that's pretty decent. This is what I print all of my patterns at, uh, or the vast majority of them anyway. Is it six stitches per inch? Anything full coverage is printed at six. And the back page over here does not change. Now if we fit it to a certain page count, we'll say four, we'll hit preview, and it will calculate uh, how everything should look across those four pages, which we still get 130 by 174. So that's still impossible to read. And again, page five is just the color key that does not change. So if we go to automatic and we don't want it any smaller than eight stitches per inch, uh, when we had it at six, it was 20 pages long. So let's see what it gives us for automatic what it thinks the best way to do this is. Okay, so now that dropped it down to, what did that say, 13 pages? So yeah, now we went from 12, or from 20 pages to 12 on the pattern, and that's still pretty read, uh, readable, I feel like. 
and sometimes automatic will go to the absolute smallest you will allow it to go other times it might go bigger it just kind of is trying to find a good way to make the pattern most efficient I think is the best way that we can put that okay but let's go ahead and put it here on six stitches per inch because that's what I like now over here we can print stitches as symbols which is what we were looking at you can print them as color blocks which is fine for some patterns uh, it's absolutely not going to be fine for a pattern with 150 colors and I put it back on six so this is going to take a little bit of time for it to generate but that's fine so yeah we have now you can see what's going on with the pattern but you're never going to be able to keep this uh, keep this straight in your head so that is a bad way to uh, print for full coverage you can also stitch uh, symbols over color which I release all of my patterns both just symbols and I do symbols over color so most of you have probably seen this already if you download the, uh, the patterns that go up on patreon but I will show you what this looks like anyway and yeah we have the color so you can see really well what's going on in the background and this can help for those instances where I do forget to uh, add those pat or add those symbols back in you can still tell that that's supposed to be white in there but you also have the symbols um, this is good for people who have a hard time seeing black and white images uh, which might sound really weird if that's not a problem that you have but the black and white symbols without any color can get very confusing for some people which is why I release both um, the problem with these color ones is that they are impossible to highlight so by releasing both or by making both for yourself you'll have something that you can refer to and go okay I see that this four is supposed to be this particular shade of orange uh, so that's what I should be looking at basically because sometimes that's difficult information to get from the color key and then the back page will not change but let's go ahead here and then for some reason none I don't think I've ever seen none let's see what that looks I kind of have a feeling I know what it will look like but I've never actually seen it so let's discover this together yep I don't know what the point of this is but yep <laughs> <laughs> okay it's a it's a complete mystery I don't know why that's there so we'll put it back on some things okay so print lines as and that's uh, I'm on what am I lost color with line symbols symbol color with line symbols let's see what that looks like I think that's for back stitching this is not something I ever really use I am 98% certain that this is for back stitching though but let's just go ahead and see if it means something else yeah it looks like this is for back stitching so floss line or floss color with line symbol that's fine so now over here we can tell it to print uh, the information uh, sheet or not uh, that is basically uh, sometimes you might just need to uh, reprint a certain area or maybe you already have the information sheet but you needed to reprint off the pattern for whatever reason you lost a page that's what these two things are for so they kind of go together so let's say I only want to print uh, page one through three right now but since they all have the same information sheet I would unclick that and now it's only going to print pages one through three with no information sheet for us so let's go ahead here and the print selected area only that is if you've got this guy right here the selection tool and right print preview 
now we can tell it I only want to print that area right there so we will preview that and so this is the area that it's given us now the problem with this is that you'd have to be very very careful because we didn't necessarily select right on the lines but it's going to chart as if we started selecting at zero by zero so this is something you do have to be kind of careful with if you decide to use it so let's get rid of that now here we go printer setup this is important uh, this is how you save it as a PDF or send it directly to your printer it's kind of a coin toss whether or not if I do send something to my printer it will actually print uh, sometimes when I send it to my printer it will just print the grid and no symbols and I don't know what that's all about um, but then sometimes it will so that's just something to be on the lookout for uh, but if you want to save it as a PDF you have a few different options depending on your computer uh, but I believe that Microsoft Print to PDF is one of these ones that's just built into Windows now. I used to have to uh, use a special piece of software that I had to install, but I don't have to do that anymore. So, But you should typically have a few different PDF options if you don't have any PDF options. Uh, there is some software out there that you, that you can download. Um, and the software that you use will just depend on your operating system. I've used Ice Cream in the past, which is a weird name for PDF software, but you know what? It works. Uh, now this is a question that I do get from time to time, especially uh, whenever I put out a new postage stamp, because a lot of my postage stamps are in landscape. So you would go to Properties, and here's where you tell it if you want it to print in landscape or portrait. So it's just right there. Uh, because this one's full coverage, we'll put, uh, put it in portrait. Now, if we do have it on my brother printer and we click on properties, we're going to get all of the printer's properties. Um, so we can change the paper size. We can change here if it's in portrait or landscape. We can do all sorts of stuff. But, you know, I don't want to send it to my brother printer. I want to send it to PDF. So we'll click OK. And now that's changed, that the destination is just going there. And there is a way somewhere somewhere to uh, change that default. I just have never bothered. Uh, the print header on grid pages. This is where it says a Gretsuko by Mad X Stitcher. So you have all of these variables that it tells you right here uh, that you can use to pretty much tell the software when you put in a T in angular brackets that it will always insert the title and you can go in here and change these de uh, defaults as well. Now you can print a special footer. Uh, this one here says printed by PC stitch. You can print other things as well. Uh, if you're using a photograph or artwork by somebody you can use this section to put that person's website in here. And then you can put the uh, copyright below the grid, uh, which is what I have there, just kind of by default. Now, grid palette options. This is weird. This works fine for sprites, um, and it's something I might even get in the habit of doing with sprites. So we've got this grid palette, and you can tell it if you want it to be on the right, the left, or the bottom. If you want it to include color and description, and I will show you what this looks like. Um, this does not work very well on full coverage pieces uh, because it's not here on page one, it's not on page two, it's not on page three or page four, but now on page five, we have this weird little line that only covers up to 902. So we'll go through and on page 10, there will be more of it because it doesn't seem to know that it can fill up the entire space. So you don't want to turn that on for um, full coverage pieces. Now the page numbers, that was where we had the page numbers in the background. 
the note icons that's if you have notes for anything specific you can put those notes in here and that's something i will also uh cover at a later date overlap pages now these are important for uh for full coverage pieces Right now, my default is two. Two seems like pretty good, but let's say we want it to be five just to make it a little bit easier. Um, you might do that like if you're doing a piece with variegated floss and you really want to know how things overlap and if you need to continue on to the next page so you don't get weird lines. So we'll go ahead and click preview for this. And page one looks the same. But now you see these grayed out symbols over here. There used to be just two of them. These grayed out symbols, if you look at these, are the same as the last five symbols on this page. So this is just showing you what happened on the previous page. And you'll get that on all of them. And now you also have them up top, so it shows you the last five symbols on the page that came above it. Go away, please. So now on these pages here, you have the last five for the page that came before it and above it, but I like to keep it at two. We can tell it to print the grid lines or the line numbers. If I turn those off, you'll see what that is. And now we have no line numbers and no grid, which is just about the most difficult thing in the world to read, I think. Uh, so you do want both of those on there. Uh, it will save a little bit of printer ink, but my word. I don't know how anybody's supposed to read that. Some people might be good at it. I am not. So the information sheet. Uh, we can show only the flosses in the pattern, or we can map flosses to multiple families. So let's say um, we want to show it for anchor and J and P as well. And is there anything else that is common? Not here. So I'll show you what happens there. Uh, we can also, uh, on the info sheet, tell it what to show. So it will show the color legend, the instructions and notes, uh, and instruction notes. Most of my patterns don't have any of these. I do leave them checked though for the rare ones that do. And in the legend, you can tell it if you want to show color, strand count, manufacturer key, description, stitch count, and skeins used. And I'm going to select all of these just to show you here. Um, and since none of that is going to change anything, I'm going to put it on none and just print the information sheet. So here we go. This has just got a little bit insane. So we can see here for this symbol, the dot, it wants two strands of DMC8. There is no substitution for anchor, no substitution for DMC or for J, J and P. It tells you the name of the floss in DMC and how many stitches you're going to use and how many skeins. So usually when you see a chart that you got from Etsy or something and it has a number in brackets, that's telling you how many uh, strands you're using. And then over here it will tell you how many uh, stitches and skeins you're going to use for that color. Now if we come down here to this symbol uh, for 307, it does have a conversion for both anchor and J and P. But uh, this is really confusing. And it has made our info sheet four pages long. So we are going to turn off all that garbage. Uh, usually just the color and the manufacturer key is all you need. Oh, it still, still did that as well. So yeah, I'll go ahead and hit none as well again. And this is now back to what it looks like where we just have the symbol a little taste of the color, and then we're using DMC, color number eight. And this is typically how all of mine are going to look. So we'll go back here. So for the margins, uh, these are by default a lot bigger. I've changed my defaults to be one tenth of an inch all around. So the page margins are one tenth of an inch 
uh, on all four sides. So if we change this to say I want the left and right margins to be half an inch. And then I want the grid page margins themselves to have half an inch around them. You'll see how much this changes. So we'll hit preview. Oops. No, that's what we wanted to do. That's right. Now we have all of this buffer around the uh, grid pages. And it does make it just a little bit bigger than it might have been before. I think these were 20 pages. So it didn't change the overall size of this because it didn't spill over too much. But it does kind of make them a little bit weird. So I'm going to put these back on 10 and just see what the difference there is. Oh, don't go there. Preview. And you can see that margin is a little bit smaller now. Uh, but it's still kind of big. It's a lot bigger than I like it to be. Preview. And now this goes not quite to the edge of the page, but it does take up quite a bit of the page. And I do this uh, mostly because otherwise, if, the mar if your margins are too big, you're going to be wind up using a lot more paper than you might want to in the end. So... That's just the margin. Stamped printing is if you want to uh, print this out as an iron-on transfer. Um, but we're not going to use that. So we're going to go back to margins, preview. Just make sure that it looks absolutely how we want it to. Here's the footer where it says printed by PC Stitch. Page number, copyright. We've got the grids, we've got the numbers, we've got the symbols, title, and author. Everything looks good. So we're going to tell it to print. And we'll go uh, Gretsu Co. Black and White. So we'll save this. Okay, now that it has saved, we'll come back up here. Uh, we'll come up, up, up. There it is. Now we have it up here in my pattern folder for a Gretsu Co. We'll click on that. And Acrobat will open up. Uh, and most people, you should be able to at least get the uh, free reader version of Acrobat, uh, which will let you do some basic PDF printing. Um, I actually would be surprised if that was something that didn't even come standard. So now is where I'm going to tell it, okay, I want to print it to my printer, one copy, and we're going to print all of it. Now here's why it doesn't really matter. Uh, that I have made my margins kind of weird because if we go to actual size, you can see that it does get clipped off uh, a little bit. Uh, I actually do print a little bit larger than you want it to be. So you would put it on fit and that will just make it to where it will fit perfectly on your page uh, as well as it can possibly fit. And I do believe that is the default. You can also shrink oversized pages, which will do the same thing, or you can custom scale it. So let's scale it down to 95. Hello. There we go. And yeah, 95 seemed to be just about what it wanted to be. So yeah, it looks like it scales mine by default at 96. Uh, if your printer can handle it, you can print on both sides of the paper. I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that. Um, just because that would be really hard to highlight. And you can have it auto-detect if it should be portrait or landscape, print it in portrait, or be a weirdo and print it in landscape. But that is uh, useful for those postage stamps and other things that I do print in landscape. And we have the entire PDF, but let's say we know that we're not going to have room for all 21 pages. In here we can go, I want 1 th through 3 and 21. So now when we scroll through the uh, preview down here, we have page 1, 2, 3 of the chart, and page 4 is the information sheet. And then we would go ahead and print that. I'm not going to do that though. Send it to your printer and it is all done and ready to be stitched. But that's just the first little video 
on PC Stitch that I wanted to go ahead and put out. Uh, looks like it took me about an hour to film this, so hopefully I can chop that down and make it a little bit more uh, concise and easy to follow. I am going to be doing more uh, videos like this, though, in the future, covering individual things within PC Stitch. I'm going to look up and see definitively if there is a way to get it to actually recognize white floss. I don't know why it stopped doing this. It is super irritating and the worst thing in the world, honestly. But that's where I'm going to go ahead and end this one today. So if you have any questions about PC Stitch, uh, anything that you would like to learn, anything that you're stuck on, please put them down in the comments below and I will put that on the list for something to focus on in a future video. But that is going to be all for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for liking, commenting, subscribing, all that fun stuff. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.